we make things. We use our hands, minds, and machines to build, to fix, to improve. We're known as do-it-yourselfers, home improvement fans, fix-it fanatics, inventors. At our core, though, we're all makers. So let's jump in and make something. Hi, I'm Ron Hazelton. Welcome to the show. It's better to rebuild than replace. That's my mantra. Well, maybe not always, but I do get a kick out of giving new life to something on its last legs. Case in point, my gas grill. I take it from barely working to nearly new in a matter of hours. Then I'll shift my restoration focus and head for Cajun country to help a New Orleans couple revive their weather-worn deck. You're gonna like this show. Well, I'm rolling out my toolbox because I'm a man on a mission. My grill over here has been with me for some time. My wife thinks it's time to replace it. It's kind of worn out. I say rebuild it. So let's get cooking. First to go are the grills. Then it's goodbye to the ceramic briquettes, long overdue for retirement. Now the grate that supports the ceramic briquettes, well, it's pretty badly deteriorated. As a matter of fact, I've even tried to make some repairs on it before by cutting strips of sheet metal and sort of bridging the places where it was totally gone. But I think the time has come for a little better quality repair. Well, now I can see why I haven't been getting the results out of my grill. Look at these burners. They're completely plugged up right here and here from debris and rust. And over here, they're burnt through. Look at these big holes. Now also, there's an igniter on this grill. If I push this button down here, these units right here are supposed to spark and start the gas. That hasn't worked for a long time. So I'm gonna take everything out. Now I can turn my attention to the firebox. The inside walls are caked with years of baked on gunk. A flexible putty knife takes it off very quickly. To cut down on the mess, I use my shop vac to catch and dispose of the loose material. Well, I've gotten most of the nasty stuff off the inside of the firebox. Now I've noticed that there's some oxidation on the outside right here. So I'm gonna go after that next. For this, a wire brush is the best tool. Now, because uh, there have been a lot of cooking uh, oils and grease around this, I'm going to do one final thing before I put a coat of paint on here, and that's to sort of wipe everything down with some denatured alcohol. A bit of masking tape will keep the spray paint from messing up the control panel. Well, I'd say we're ready to start painting. Now, a grill like this gets really hot, so you can't use just any kind of paint on it. What I've chosen is a high temp paint, which should hold up pretty well. Now, I find that if I hold a spray can about 10 inches from the surface and make long, smooth, overlapping strokes, I get good, even coverage. Rather than just reversing direction at the end of the stroke, I move off the edge and momentarily take my finger off the button. This keeps me from getting drips and runs. Wow, the outside looks terrific. Now it's time to make it work as good as it looks, and that means I've got to find some new parts. I've located a garden center a few miles away that stocks repair parts for my grill. Hey, you got it. All set, Ron. Briquettes, huh? right and left burner, right. lava grate. Okay, what about the igniter? Igniters are both on the burners. Oh, they come attached? Yes, they do. All right, all right. Thank you very much. Got my work cut out for me. All right, thank you. Appreciate it, Joe. Okay. Ah, now for the fun, putting all the new parts in. Just look at this compared to the old one. I'm surprised this was working at all. Everything was rusted, plugged up here, broken away. Well, bye-bye, old burner. 
in with a new one. All I've got to do is drop this wire through this hole right here and slip the end of the burner over the valve, just like that. That's all there is to it. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. The igniter wires push onto terminals at the igniter button. Well, the burners are in. They're working fine. I've checked them out. Now I'm going to install the new grate. Remember this? It was completely burnt through. Now this sits above the flame and supports the ceramic briquettes. Here's the new one right here. Quite a difference, eh? And it just sits right in place. Like that. My new ceramic briquettes are ready to go, and it's probably a good time to replace them. You can see on the old one here how they were getting sort of crumbly. Well, about all I have left to do is to put in my grills. There's one. And two. Attach my cable. And I'm ready for some grilling. A few hours ago, my grill may have looked like a lost cause. Now it looks practically brand new. What's even more important, though, is how it cooks. I'm going to fire it up and find out. Now this is what I call enjoying the fruits of my labor. Over time, a little bit of paint stored in a large container gets pretty bad. And if I left it this way long enough, it probably would be totally unusable. Also, when I've got it stored in cans like this, I forget which paint goes where. So I've come up with a good leftover paint storage solution. I've started saving plastic water bottles of all different sizes. Now the key to keeping leftover paint in good condition is to minimize the amount of air in the container. So I match the size of the bottle with the amount of leftover paint that I have. A roll of masking tape keeps the bottle from tipping and a paper towel will catch any drips. If the paint has a lot of loose debris, I may put a paint filter inside the funnel. Now once I've gotten the paint in the bottle, I remove the funnel, and this is the secret part here. Take a half a dozen marbles and drop them in. I label the paint using a felt tip marker, and when it comes time to do a touch up, I simply give it a shake. Those marbles in the bottom agitate and mix the paint, open the top, pour out what I need, close the top, and do my touch-up. Now when the paint level gets, say, halfway down in the bottle, then I just transfer it to a smaller one. Now one of the things that I find a bit annoying is the sound of sliding utensils inside my kitchen drawers when I open and close them. This non-slip shelf liner works really well to stop that, and if I've got several drawers of the same size, I cut the liner to size by first making a cardboard or plywood template. Place the template on top of the liner. Take a razor blade. And there it is. Now, in the same way that the template precisely fits every drawer, so does the piece of material that I cut from it. But I still find that it's possible to get some wrinkles in here. So I like to take one additional step. I put a light coating of spray adhesive on the back of the liner, just a little bit. Then, while it's still tacky, 
I drop it into the drawer. There we go. No slip, no slide, and best of all, no noise. In this week's sweepstakes, we're giving away a Ryobi four-piece lithium-ion compact combo power tool kit. It includes a circular saw, a work light, cordless drill and charger, and reciprocating saw, all in a rugged carrying case. Now these tools are powerful, yet compact, lightweight, and easy to handle. The lithium-ion batteries hold a charge 40% longer. To enter the sweepstakes, just go to ronhazelton.com and click on the sweepstakes banner. Kenneth and Andretta Allen of New Orleans, Louisiana, have asked for a little help, so I'm going to pay him a house call. Aye, 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 aye. I don't know. This may be beyond, be beyond uh, help here. At first glance, it doesn't look good. The deck boards are splintered and have faded to a dingy shade of gray. Kenneth shows me a few other problems. Some of the boards have actually twisted out of place and nail heads are popping up all over. I can't tell you how many times I've piled these things down. They have a way of coming, creeping back up though. Things look pretty bad all right, but nonetheless, I'm fairly confident a revival is possible. Several of the problems that you see on this deck, the popping nails, the cracks on the surfaces of the board, the twisting lumber, are caused by the wood getting wet, soaking up water, expanding, and then drying out and contracting. That continual movement, expansion and contraction, causes almost all of these problems. And the way to prevent it is to make sure that you put a good sealer on your deck every year or two. But our first step is to fix those twisted planks. And we begin by removing the old nails. I drive the prongs of a nail puller beneath the heads, and then Andretta pries them out with the other end. Next, we'll try to straighten out those boards. Now, this is my high-tech deck board straightening tool right here. Right. What I've done is taken a 2 by 4 cut a notch out of it, mm -hmm. and this is how it's going to work, I hope. This slips right over the end of the twisted 2 by 4 like this. Oh, that's a great idea. Andretta would have never thought of that. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I bet you might have. No, I wouldn't have. Want to give it a push, see if it works? Yes. That should straighten that board right up. Oh, Kenneth reattaches the problem plank with 5-inch screws, which create a stronger grip than nails. The real advantage to fixing this board rather than replacing it is that we won't wind up with a strip of new lumber that doesn't match the rest of the deck. There we go, I can huh? Feel, yes. Oh, that's what about a that? Great Perfect. idea. Perfect. I Such a wait. simple solution to, to what was a big problem for you know, us. We would have went to the store and bought all kinds of contraptions, and it probably wouldn't have worked as easy as this. With the twisted board straightened out, we turn our attention to those popping nails. The ones we can grip with a nail puller, we remove, replacing them with nails that are thicker and slightly longer for better holding power. For the nails that are nearly flush with the surface, we use a drift punch to countersink them slightly. A few of these old boards, though, just won't lie flat and require a bit of encouragement from Kenneth. This is called trust. <laughs> <laughs> or, Do you trust me? Or potential lawsuit. <laughs> uh -oh. With all the nails driven in, we're ready to clean the deck with a deck wash and brightener made just for the purpose. We pour the solution into a garden sprayer and I wet the deck thoroughly. Kenneth and Andretta follow behind, lightly scrubbing. But it's the chemicals that are really doing most of the work, loosening the accumulated dirt and bleaching out stains and discolorations. After about 15 minutes, we begin rinsing off the cleaning and bleaching solution using a pressure washer that connects to a garden hose and boosts household water pressure by about 15 times. The high pressure water produces a scrubbing effect as it rinses off the chemicals. To see just how well the deck is responding, we stop midway and make a comparison. Now see, here's your old board right yes. here. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the new board mm -hmm. with the deck wash and the power sprayer. Yes. And you can see none of this is hard work. No, it isn't. Well, enough admiring our progress. We refill the garden sprayer and go back to work. After the cleaning is complete and the surface dry, 
It's becoming clear the deck that was once presumed ready for the kindling pile is well on its way to a comeback. Clean. It's beautiful. It's bright. Yes. It's ready for a little sealer. Okay. It looks really, really great. Did you, did you, would you believe this was underneath no. all that? Our next step is to refill the garden sprayer, this time with a deck sealer that will help restore the wood's color and protect it from weathering. All right, guys. Now, what we want to try to do here is keep this maybe about a foot or so away from the deck okay. and move it back and forth in a nice, even motion like that. Keeping the sprayer head a consistent distance from the surface will ensure a uniform coating. This sealer goes on milky, but it dries clear. The main purpose of a sealer is to slow down the rate at which the wood absorbs water and greatly reduce the expansion and contraction that caused most of this cracking and nail popping. Couldn't be easier, huh? Oh, it's going on great. Now, this product, given your conditions here, will probably seal your deck for one to two years. It's just amazing how quickly you can apply sealer with a garden sprayer. Before we know it, we're finished. Didn't even take us 20 minutes to do this whole deck. No. <laughs> we have no excuse now not to maintain it. Did you say that? Yes, I do. <laughs> it's always so much better when it comes from you. <laughs> me. The deck sealer needs to dry for several hours before getting any foot traffic, and overnight before we can replace the furniture. But that doesn't keep us from admiring our success from a distance. I gotta tell you, I feel like we've gone back in time. I mean, this deck probably looks like it did pretty much the day it was put down. I've never yes. seen it look like this. Yeah, it was here when you bought the house, right? It was yeah, here when pretty, we bought the house. never looked this mm -hmm. good. And it was pretty easy, too. Yes. Yeah, it was a little work, but it was a lot easier than I would have ever thought it would have been. Good. Mm -hmm. Glad to hear that. It looks great. Because this isn't the real reason Andretta had me come here. <laughs> this was your trial project. And now that you found it so easy, the real job is this fence that runs all the way around the property here. All the way around. Cool. Cool, huh? Can you do it with Dad now? Yeah. yeah. Now, <laughs> honestly, when you first saw this deck, did you think it could turn out this well? You know, there's a lot of satisfaction in restoring things. Oftentimes, you find renewed beauty just beneath the surface. How appropriate to rediscover that here in New Orleans, where people know the value of restoring the past. You know, if I've got a nice piece of artwork that I want framed, I'm going to take it to a professional. But there are times when I want a very simple frame around the bulletin board or something for the kids' room. In that case, I just cut out the frame stock on the table saw. Now, the trickiest part to making a frame like this is actually attaching it together. First, I lay out the four sides of my frame on a flat surface. Then flip the sections over so the miters are facing up. Yellow woodworker's glue is a good choice for this job. I put a little in a plastic bottom I've cut from a water bottle. Then brush the glue on the face of the miter joints and press them together. Now here's the tool that makes the clamping part of this job really simple. It's called a band clamp. It consists of a clamp base and a long nylon strap threaded through plastic brackets that fit over the frame corners. I remove the slack from the strap by pulling it through a slot on the base and tightening the lock. As I turn the screw, the band clamp tightens evenly on all four corners, pulling the joints together. Finally, I double check to make sure everything is square. So, if you've got the right tool, in this case the band clamp, putting a frame together like this is a snap. We make things. We use our hands, minds, and machines to build, to fix, to improve. We're known as do-it-yourselfers, home improvement fans, fix-it fanatics, inventors. At our core, though, we're all makers. So let's jump in and make something. Hi, I'm Ron Hazelton. Welcome to the show. Now, today's program is about the rooms we live in and the openings between them. 
My house call takes me to a couple looking for a separation, a separation of spaces, that is. Then, back here at my own place, I find that widening the doorway to my living room has created a real problem with my hardwood floors. Two very interesting challenges. Now, it seems to me that many home improvement projects start with a vision. That would appear to be true for Ben and Catherine Moorhead. Now, they've taken care of their share of projects since they bought their house a while back and have their sights set on the next challenge. Catherine, in particular, has a very clear idea of what she wants. Well, we're trying to add a little separation and a little bit of interest in the living room den area. Right now, it's just a huge gap. In a lot of the new homes that are going up, you see these beautiful columns separating two rooms. And I thought, why can't we do that here? Now, I don't see any reason at all why Ben and Catherine can't have exactly what they want. I figure they just need a little bit of a jump start. So I head over to Ridgefield to see about creating a bit of separation for my friends. Hey guys. Hi Ron. How, How are, are you? Thanks oh, for coming. Oh, thank you very much. I love the rocks. I guess that's where the ridge comes from. We're up, on, up on a ridge right. here. That's yep. right. Yep. So these are the two rooms that you kind of want to separate a little bit. Yes. You don't want a wall up here. No, we decided against a wall. We yeah. like open space, but the problem is this, this window, this room was added afterward. Mm -hmm. it looks this like room over here was added. Yeah, and it, it looks like it's just bolted onto the house. There's really mm -hmm. no transition. Okay. So you think by making a, a pair, like there's more of a division between these two rooms? Exactly, and give it a little interest, a little detail. So, so what are the actual dimensions you're thinking of? I was thinking about 40 inches high and okay. perhaps 17 inches wide. 17? Yeah. That's very precise. It 17 is. inches. It is. Not 20, not 15, <laughs> 17. Our 17. marching orders are always very precise. Well, that's good. Now, I'm not doubting Catherine's judgment, but just to make sure, I construct a simple plywood mock up to help us visualize the dimensions. Maybe a little too close. In. A little too yeah. much. Right. Okay, let me come into about. Here, how's that look? Further in? A couple more inches yeah. in. How about somewhere in this range? Well, maybe one more inch. What do you think? I, you know, honey, I, you're the decision maker here, so. Okay. I, I like it. Well, Catherine's happy, so Ben checks things out from his point of view. I like, this is fine. You see? Is that it? Look at that. Wow. You did that, <laughs> huh? First time, perfect cut. Great. Four pieces of two by four will be assembled to make the frame for what is called a knee wall. Now these are the two by fours you cut outside and we're gonna use these to make up a wall frame. So if you just kinda hang on to that for me, I'm gonna attach these together with some three inch screws. up okay and if you grab that piece of two by four right there okay and set it right up on the top okay, okay I'm gonna have you put these in perfect excellent we'll lay this right on here that'll give us the extra thickness we need the wall that we're connecting to is a little thicker than typical, so we're adding strips of 1x2 to our frame to give us the added depth we'll need. Excellent. Okay, so there's our wall frame. It's going to sit right in here, like that, okay? We attach the wall frame first to the existing wall and then to the floor. When it's secure, we head out to the garage and start cutting the drywall that will cover it. First, we score the paper on the face of the wall board. Then stand the panel on edge, break it along the score line, and finally cut the paper on the back. Excellent, now we're just gonna snap it back the other way like this. Okay, there's your cut. Um, okay, so this is half inch wall board here. You wanna grab your, uh, your screw gun right there. Okay. Just go ahead and start putting this in. All right, start here. Mm -hmm. All right, now we make it a real wall, closed on both sides. OK, 
Okay, Catherine. Our next step is to attach this metal bead to protect the otherwise fragile edges and give us sharp, clean lines. You guys, the only thing you got to remember here is try not to hit the corner, because if you do, we end up with a dent, and that's not too pretty. So just take your time. Okay. Enjoy. Okay. You ready? And we'll now have dual hammers. Or is say. it dueling hammers? <laughs> Time for a little taping. Okay. You've done this before? Yes. You have? I have. So you're a taping I'm veteran. I'm the taper of the family. Oh. Well, let's just dive right in then. All right. Very nice, Catherine. Catherine is putting down what I call a bedding coat of joint compound. We'll cover the joint with paper tape, which I first dip in water, then pull between my fingers to remove the excess moisture. From my experience, I've found damp tape like this adheres better. You want to place that so the center of the tape is right on the seam. Okay. Again, keep the knife flat and you're pressing it in. Oh. Okay. Ben, you're up. Ben uses joint compound to conceal the flanges on the metal corner bead and blend it into the wall. The compound we're using today will set in about 45 minutes. Then we'll apply a second coat and when it's dry, sand it smooth. My friends Catherine and Ben have a space problem. They have two adjoining rooms that combined are just too big. The solution? A knee wall with columns. We finished the framing and drywall. Now it's time for the woodwork. Well, we've got both of our knee walls in, just finishing up the sanding on this one over here. How's it going? Great. Oh, it's going well. It's looking good. Oh, that's nice. Really nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you've been busy doing that. Uh, I've been out cutting um, this ledge or shelf, whatever you want to call it, that's going to go on top here. Mm -hmm. This is a piece of poplar. And all I've done is uh, sort of cut a notch out of it, put a little bit of a round over on the edges here. And this will just slip right in here like that. Well, that's that lovely. looks great. Okay. Very nice touch. That's not going to go anywhere, no. huh? Right. Now we're going to start trimming out the insides of your openings here with, I guess you'd call it jam material, all right? So let's start with the top piece right up here. This kind of woodwork, or millwork as it's often called, adds interest and detail to just about any room. It can turn a wall from ordinary into elegant. Hey, 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 look what I've got. Your new column. Oh, wow. Ooh, look at that. Uh-oh, I think I made a little mistake. I think I'm a little too big for the opening right here. Just, okay. just a little. I'll weave it. Seriously, though, you do have to decide what portion of this you want. <laughs> okay. uh, top, bottom, middle, what do you think? I think the top because of all of the detail up there. What do I think, honey? You think the top. The top looks great to me. I love the way you two just agree on pretty much everything, don't you? It's great. So the column comes with a capital and a base. I'm going to stack the capital and the base on top of each other. Ben, I'm going to give you a tape measure. Now, if you'd measure from the top right here yep. to the jam, I'll know how long to cut this column. It's 34 and 7 sixteenths. You got it. Okay, let's cut. Now getting a straight cut on a tapered column like this can be a bit tricky. For me, the best way to do it is to draw a line all the way around and make the cut with my Japanese hand saw. All right. Wow. Beautiful. Okay. The shortened column is attached to the base by applying glue and then toenailing. Glue is also applied to the top of the column. And the two sections of the capital are set in place and nailed. Try. All right. Well, shall we give it a go? Hey, you did it. That looks nice. nice. Good job, guys. It came guys. out great. 
Uh, let's see how we do it. Yeah, you have to get them really on the flat. Oh, look at that. I can tell already. It's a beautiful Oh, fit. man. Well, you know, when you see a paintbrush in hand on a project like this, we're nearing the end. Well, I'm going to go, you guys. You can finish this up. You've got it well in hand. Well, you got us there, Ron. Appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank Don't you. Don't too late now. We won't. Okay. We won't do it. And enjoy the room. Bye bye. Thank you. Well, sweetie, between your design and his uh, skillful implementation, we've really added a lot of value here, don't you think? Uh, absolutely. Are you happy? I, I love it. Well, now that's quite sweet. Who would have thought that separating a couple of rooms could bring a couple even closer together? You know, I'm not one to shatter misconceptions, but bigger is not necessarily always better. In this week's sweepstakes, we're giving away a Ryobi four-piece lithium-ion compact combo power tool kit. It includes a circular saw, a work light, cordless drill and charger, and reciprocating saw, all in a rugged carrying case. Now these tools are powerful, yet compact, lightweight, and easy to handle. The lithium-ion batteries hold a charge 40% longer. To enter the sweepstakes, just go to ronhazelton.com and click on the sweepstakes banner. A little while ago, I widened this doorway from here out to here and then put in these French doors. I'm really happy with the way this turned out. But when I took this portion of the wall out, well, of course, there was no flooring here, so I had to put new strips in. Now I'm faced with two problems. These strips are slightly higher than the surrounding floor, and they're a different color. Well, actually, they're completely unfinished. So what I need to do is to level this down and try to match the color and finish. You know what this is? Well, if you said a paint scraper, you'd be absolutely right. I mean, are you wondering why I'd want to use a paint scraper on this job? Well, properly prepared, this tool can do a great job of removing thin layers of wood. And properly prepared means getting it really sharp. Well, in this case, I'm going to bring my sharpening station right to the work site here. So first thing, take the paint scraper, put it in our portable vise here, and tighten it up. Now this is a, uh, a 10 inch, maybe this is a 12 inch uh, mill file. What I want to do is just pass this along the edge of the blade like this. Now, if you look really closely here, you see how shiny this is all the way across the blade. That means I'm getting a really sharp edge from one side all the way over to the other. Well, this feels pretty sharp. Let's give it a try here. I'll start here in the middle where there's a little bit of a ridge. Now, if it's working right, we should be kind of like peeling off some wood here. See, that's what I want to see there. Uh, that's much better, by the way. Than, uh, than dust. That means that we're actually cutting the wood fibers. Now, this is working pretty well, you can see. Kind of almost functioning like a plane. However, I'm going to switch to a different tool right up in here. Now this uh, scraper is much narrower and it has a carbide tip right here, which means it never has to be sharpened. And it's great for getting up into tight spots like this. Now as I'm getting up close to the edge of the board here, I've switched to a smaller scraper. Same idea, same shaped blade. Just gives me a little more precise control. Well, I've gone about as far as I can go with the scraper. I'm gonna tell you, this is a workout. Um, what I wanna do now is take a random orbital sander. This is a fairly aggressive sander. I wanna smooth everything off and I wanna sand off uh, the finish that was on this one plank right here. But I'm going to be very careful only to sand right up to the edge of this plank. Well, this is coming along just fine. Uh, next step for me is to take some wood filler and fill up some nail holes right here. And then I've got a, just a couple of places where there's a small gap. 
Now, my technique for putting in wood filler is to put in enough to fill up the crack or the hole. Maybe slightly overfill it, but not much more because excess just means that's stuff you got to sand off. I use a vibrating palm sander with 100 grit paper for the final smoothing. Now it's time to remove any dust on the surface, first with a vacuum and then with a sticky tack cloth made just for this purpose. All right, clean, smooth, and dust-free. Now it's time to put a finish on here. The question is, what color finish? Now, I think these floors have just a clear coating on them, but I'm not 100% sure. So what I want to do is a little test here to uh, kind of give me an idea what this would look like with a clear finish on it before I commit to that. And one way to do that is to put either water or alcohol on the wood and wet it temporarily. I'm going to use the alcohol because it'll evaporate very quickly. Now see, if I just put a clear finish on, that's what it's going to probably look like. As you can see, with just a clear finish, the new wood would be a little lighter or less yellow than the adjacent planks. So I'm going to adjust the color by brushing on some shellac that has been thinned with denatured alcohol. At first, the new wood appears too orange, so I wipe off a bit of the shellac while it's still wet. Well, down to the final step right here. I'm going to put a clear polyurethane coating on this, and uh, it might impart just a touch of color, but I don't expect very much. I've poured some of it into this container. This is a semi-gloss finish, which is, I think, what's on here, not, not high-gloss. So let's go ahead and brush this on. Oh, yeah. Well, there we go, and you know what? No one is ever going to know that those boards were new arrivals. Heating oil and natural gas prices are skyrocketing, and that means that homeowners are going to be facing higher winter heating bills than ever. But some are going to begin to investigate alternative heating sources, and one is the pellet stove. I've got one right here from Harmon. Now, instead of burning split wood, these stoves burn wood pellets. This is actually compressed wood made mostly of waste, sawdust and chips. You fill this hopper up and that provides enough fuel for this stove to operate for about 24 hours. It's completely automatic. The only part that's not automatic is having to carry in the bags of fuel. Many dealers though will deliver them. To start the stove you simply set the thermostat to the desired temperature and switch the power on. The stove self-ignites and the fuel pellets are automatically fed into the fire chamber. Within minutes, the stove is up and running. You can figure that a stove like this will cost about $600 to operate for the heating season. And it produces 50,000 BTUs. That's enough heat to heat a house of 2,200 square feet. So if you're looking for ways to knock your fuel bill down, you might want to check out the pellet stove.